Hi, I'm Louis Falgu, and welcome to Essentials. And today I've got a little album called Trout Mask Replica by Captain Beefheart and his magic band. I'd like to take this moment to thank all of you who voted in the poll to determine what album would be covered on today's Essentials. And uh, you guys spoke pretty hardcore in favor of Trout Mask Replica. This thing won by about 10 points with, I think, 67 votes or some, somewhere around there. So clearly you want me to talk about this, and that's good because I want to talk about it too. So Captain Beefheart and his magic band released their debut record, Safe as Milk, in 1967, and it went mostly unnoticed at the time. It was an album that demonstrated the band's blues rock tendency, mixing it in with genres like psychedelic rock and experimental rock. And although the album is very listenable, it's certainly a bit out there, and right off the bat you can tell that Beefheart is just a absolutely wild and enigmatic performer. His voice channels Howlin' Wolf, but like, amped up on steroids. It's gritty and expressive and gnarly. Now after this album came 1968's Strictly Personal, an album which I don't much care for. This album mixed in a lot more psychedelic rock and a lot more experimental rock. Compared to Safe as Milk, it's way left but it certainly showed a lot of growing pains, and while the band was managing to play more complex rhythms, the production just didn't do it much favors, and for that matter, the songs didn't do it much favors either. However, even though that album is certainly inaccessible, it is nowhere near the monstrosity I'm talking about today. It's pretty crazy, actually, the leap that this album is from both albums before it. Sure, Strictly Personal was getting there, but this album is just absolutely insane, even compared to that. The band was kept in this one house by the domineering Captain Beefheart, aka Don Van Vliet, and they were forced to constantly rehearse these songs that would appear on this album, all of which were composed from Captain Beefheart playing the piano and being transcribed by the drummer, John French. Now, Captain Beefheart did not know how to play the piano, so the melodies that he ended up playing were kind of ridiculous, to say the least. Add that to the fact that he had no regard for which time signatures would fit in the best, so oftentimes you'll get two completely asynchronous time signatures playing at once in the two separate guitar parts on this album. And what's probably the most fascinating thing is the fact that it does not they don't really function as your typical rock band on this album. Normally, if you have two guitars, one would be the rhythm guitar and one would be the lead guitar, but here they're both playing their own thing with no regard for what each other are doing. You'd also expect the bass and the drums to be locked into a groove, although that almost never happens either. And then you've got Beefheart on top of this chaos, adding even more chaos with his weird beat poetry and his ridiculous vocal melodies and vocal inflections and just utterly strange lyrics, but somewhat funny lyrics too, there's definitely a sense of humor there. And this all comes together into what is perhaps the most confounding double album of all time, or at least one of them. And right off the bat on Frownland, you realize that this album is utterly insane and wildly complex. It seems like almost every two lyrical phrases in the poem that Captain Beefheart is singing here, you have all the instruments switch into completely new passages, never locking in with each other. And so, especially on first listen, it really just sounds like a bunch of random bullshit. This is mainly because the band really doesn't give you any time to pay attention to what's happening. They give you seconds at most before switching it up to something that's just as confusing as what you heard last. That being said, what's being played here is not only extremely complex, but also rather evocative. The way that the rhythms actually line up, and the way that the drums hold the whole thing together is absolutely captivating. You, you just can't take your ears off of what's going on here. And upon further listens, you begin to notice the individual melodies that are being played, and you realize that the album really isn't atonal. It's really not even amelodic. It only sounds that way because nothing is played with regard to how it sounds with the other instruments. But what you get is sheer confusion. And it's, it's really overwhelming, but it's a feeling that this album clearly is going for, and it manages to strike perfectly. 
And only to further confuse you, the next track is a vocal only piece called The Dust Blows Forward and The Dust Blows Back, and it's pretty funny actually. And, and there are three tracks like this. There's also Well and there's also uh, Orange Claw Hammer. And in these songs, whenever Beefheart makes a mistake, he just keeps going. They don't really cut anything out. It's really not as precisely rehearsed as the other songs are, and it ends up being actually very funny and really charming. And in the case of Well, it's actually very moving in an odd way. Now, the sound of Frownland is not the sound of the entire album, but it's certainly the sound of at least half of it, because many of these songs continue in the same vein as Frownland, each offering distinctly confusing and asynchronous musical passages, shifting into new asynchronous musical passages within short periods of time, and they all tend to be equally as complex. And one of the more interesting things that I find is that, as I've listened to this album countless times at this point, there are these individual moments in many of these tracks that really stand out as being actually kind of musical after you listen for a while. And on the song Pachuco Cadaver, you've just got great riff after great riff. And yes, they may not immediately stand out to you, but after a while, they certainly do. And the way that Drumbo, or John French as I referred to him earlier, but you know, he was called Drumbo, the way that he plays along with these riffs is wonderful. And also the fact that in the first half of the song, the bass is completely completely out of step with everything else. Perhaps the craziest track on the album is Pina, and it's also definitely the funniest. I crack up every single time I hear this. Just that wild screaming in the background, I don't know who's doing it, but somebody's going like, and just the ridiculous lyrics in this poem, like smoke billowing up from between her legs made me vomit beautifully. And now that I've mentioned the lyrics, this is another thing that I just love. I love Beefheart's abstract Dada-esque poetry here. The lyrics are completely ridiculous, although sometimes he does have things to say in these poems, but even then, they're delivered in such a strange way. But still, the words flow so well. And it's not just the words that flow really well, it's also the music in a weird way. The ways in which uh, these songs transition from section to section is so effortless, and you, you can tell how much they rehearsed these tracks, especially on the two-part hair pie instrumental. The first of which begins with Beefheart just going wild on the saxophone, uh, and it's completely atonal, as it often is when he plays it on this album, which he does a few times, as the instrumental uh, hair pie begins to fade in. And it's such a cool effect. I just love the way they did this. It's so smart. Hair Pie Bake 2 does away with this transition and is essentially just the instrumental going on underneath, which is so tightly constructed. It's just wonderful. Now, although the record is chock full of songs like Wildlife and She's Too Much For My Mirror and Steal Softly Through Snow, which are complete absurdity, as complex and rehearsed as they are, they certainly sound absurd. Now, the, yes, it does have a lot of that, but it also has some more straightforward tracks as well, which, yes, they're incredibly strange, but uh, they're eminently more listenable. Perhaps the most famous example being Moonlight on Vermont. Sure, the guitar riff is completely insane, um, but the song works as a song, and it's uh, that's, that's an interesting thing, and it's probably the most accessible piece of music here. Also, the song Elegaroo is a wonderfully dissonant rock song. The riff just sounds so dirty, because just because of how dissonant it sounds. But the chorus is actually fairly normal sounding, I mean, a bit quirky, but... And then you've got like a bridge section to this song which contains the first utterance of the famous line, Fast and Bulbous, which comes up, I believe, three times, and every time it does, it's hilarious. A few of the tracks open with skits like that where Beefheart and his band will just say some ridiculous garbage, and it's funny every time. What do you run on, Rocket Morton? I run on beans. The song When Big Joan Sets Up is certainly more straightforward because it's very riff-centric. The riff is wild and ridiculous and super weird, but it's also fucking awesome. This is one of my favorite tracks on the album because this riff is so invigorating. I just, I love the way that it sounds. I love how crazy it is and how all over the place it is. And then, you know, uh, Beefheart doing this weird like, When Big Joan 
perfect kind of voice. And the way that this track ends is actually really fucking awesome. It's this amazing climax where the riff continues, but now Beefheart's atonal saxophone solo on top of it, and it keeps getting louder and louder and louder. It's it's very subtle, but if you pay attention, they're getting more intense as, as this track uh, sort of fades out. It, it doesn't fade out as it ends. I also gotta mention My Human Gets Me Blues, which is such a jam. I mean, an extremely weird jam, but God, this one goes really hard if you can get into this, the crazy sound of it. The, the guitars, they're so blaring, and they sound this way on the whole album. Not only is the guitar work phenomenal, but the guitar sound is phenomenal. In fact, I would say this record's production in general is pretty much great. Occasionally there are some mishaps, like on Dachau Blues, when at one point, uh, I get, I think Beefheart hits the microphone or something, but you can, it, it's just this, it's a sound as if somebody hits a microphone, I don't know exactly what's going on. But in a way, these flaws do enhance the album. It's the same reason why they would have left flaws in on some of the vocal-only tracks. It's charming, it has, it makes the album feel more alive, in a way. But back to the guitar work, because the guitar sounds so blaring, I think it makes the album all the more overwhelming and all the more confusing and all the more weird. Now, I mentioned that this band has blues rock tendencies and I haven't even really said anything about that yet, but even on the strangest tracks, there is a sort of bluesy quality to everything that's being played, especially the drum work. It's, it's extremely subtle, more so on some tracks than others, but if you listen to a track like Ant-Man B, it's, it kind of sounds like an extremely dissonant and asynchronous blues rock song. Now, perhaps the most difficult thing in trying to structure an album like this is probably attempting to close it. I mean, how do you end an album like Trout Mask Replica? Well, you end it with one of the best fucking things in existence, Veterans Day Poppy. This track is very much separated into three separate movements. You've got the opening section, which you know, it's, yes, quirky, but not altogether too weird. And it sounds extremely joyous, like it's a wondrous occasion to be at the end of Trout Mask Replica. I mean, I guess it means the album's ending soon, so for me that's not exactly wondrous, but, you know, I'm sure for a lot of people that's a momentous occasion. And then this transitions into perhaps the most accessible moments of the entire record, because it really just sounds like some great fucking blues rock. You've got this segment for a moment where the band just rocks. It's the first time they really let themselves do this in a way that feels conventional. And it's extremely exciting. It's like a treat. You've listened to the album all the way up here. Let us give you something that really sounds like just some fucking great rock. But like many other moments on this record, it doesn't last long. And in a wonderful and brilliant crossfade, the final half of this track is the most beautifully ugly piece of music I think I've ever heard. And it just keeps going, and I feel like I never want it to stop. Not only is Drumbo's drum work on this section wonderful and great to listen to, but the guitar work is so ugly. It's so ugly, but like, in such a composed and rehearsed way, in a way that sounds so great. That's why I describe it as beautifully ugly. It's so, ugh, oh, it's so good. And this is how the album ends itself with this section just continuing a few times until it, it just stops and that's the album. And it's an amazing way to end an album that was full of great, strange guitar work, wonderful bass lines that never seem to match up to those guitars, and creative, impressive and expressive drum work from John French, and of course, wild vocal performances from Captain Beefheart himself. But I suppose above all else, the best way to describe this album is extremely creative. Now, of course, for a lot of people, the creativity on display here simply isn't going to cut it for them. It is absolutely weird. It is that, that is the best word to describe this album. There really isn't a better word to describe this album. It's weird. Above everything else, it's weird. And I guarantee you that most people who hear this will claim that it's not even music. But there's a reason that this album is a classic, and it is an essential that all music fans need to hear. <laughs>
So that does it for this Essential. If you have an Essential album you'd like me to review, please leave it in the comments section and I'll be sure to consider it. There's even a chance that I'll hold another poll for the next episode, but we'll just have to wait and see about that. Uh, but the albums that were on the poll besides this one are albums I plan to get to anyway. Bye guys! Take my hand and come with me It's not too late for you If it's not too late for me To find my home Where man can stand